Two actual epitaphs. Now, epitaph is what they write on a gravestone. The first one said, Here lies a miser who lived for himself and cared for nothing but gathering wealth. Now, where he is and just how he fares, nobody knows, cares. Wouldn't you hate to have that be the summary of your life? Here's another one. Sacred to the memory of General Charles George Gordon, who at all times and everywhere gave his strength to the weak, his substance to the poor, his sympathy to the suffering, his heart to God. What a difference. And the difference is love. That's what we're talking about this morning as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Someday our life is going to be summed up. And the main concern we'll have is what have I done in my life? What have I done for the Lord? Uh, love is an action. It's, it's not just an attitude or a feeling. Uh, we confuse it uh, with that oftentimes. And you need to understand, love is always related to someone else. You realize that? Love is always related to someone else. It, it always has an object. Someone has said that there's two kinds of people. Those who always think of their rights and those who always think of their duties. <laughs> uh, we live in a world of people who love their rights. Uh, many demand, love me, honor me. Jesus said in John 13, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. He commands us to love. And that's what 1 Corinthians 13 is about. We've, we've read it several times. I want to read it again. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. As a child, I spake as a child. I understood, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know it, but then shall I know it even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. The greatest of these is charity. We've been looking at this for several weeks, and uh, uh, the reason being is it's so important. Uh, there's, there's many things in life that, that are important, but... Uh, love is going to make uh, all the difference in your life. He starts off talking about the prominence of love. And he basically, he just says, a, a loveless person produces nothing of value. It's just noise. A loveless person, verse 2, himself is of no value. It, it, it's such a startling statement. I am nothing. And without love, I am nothing. A loveless person receives no value. Uh, it profiteth me nothing. And then he begins uh, to to teach us the, the properties of love. It's so important for us to see this because the world won't teach this to you. It will teach you lust. The world will even teach you like. <laughs> but it won't teach you love. And it's important for us to understand what God says it is. Uh, he, he says love suffers long. It's patient with people. You see it in the, the father of the prodigal son. As his son, really, really the son wrongs him. And off he goes. And the Father is waiting and willing to receive him back. Uh, love suffers long and is kind. It spends itself on others. We're not just, love isn't just kind to those that are kind to them. 
And Jesus said, if anybody can do that. But God is different. Love envies not. It's not jealous. It's happy with the success of others. You know, that's really important in a family, isn't it? It's important to be happy when someone else succeeds. Uh, I don't know if there's many brothers and sisters in here today, but uh, you need to be happy when your brother or your sister does better than you. <laughs> when they succeed. Uh, uh, love envies not. Is not boastful. Uh, you know, we're happy for others to have, have the honor. Is not puffed up. Uh, not proud. He uses an expression here. Um, behaveth itself... Uh, Doth not behave itself unseemly there in verse 5. That just means it's not rude. <laughs> uh, rude people are selfish. And that's the next one. Next one. Seeketh not her own. Love is not selfish. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, love is not easily provoked, he says there in verse 5. Uh, uh, the Lord has been convicting me about this. Uh, you know, as you look at these qualities of love, we don't always match up exactly, do we? Uh, love's not irritated or upset or angry. I don't remember where I got these. Somebody wrote down signs of anger. Irritated if you're not agreed with. Well, we'd never do that, would we? Uh, give more criticism than compliments. Short with people. It's not talking about your height. Uh, argue. Feel like God has let you down. Just some things that uh, are signs of anger in, in our heart. But we need to understand the cause of anger is selfishness. It's because we're not loving. Uh, the church at Corinth, they were even suing each other. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, how you, how's it going, brother? How's it going, brother? Yeah, see you in court. <laughs> uh, that's, the, that's not the right way, is it? We need to stop and ask ourselves, are we selfish or are, or are we selfless? Are we willing to love? And then he continues uh, this morning at the end of verse 5. Thinketh no evil. An interesting one for us to consider. He's talking about a, just a non-loving attitude, an attitude of, of resentment. Um, making a memory out of evil. Yeah, I, I've known people where what, some of their favorite stories are how people have wronged them. And they share them at every opportunity. Listen, that's not love. Love thinketh no evil. Uh, when we hate, it makes everything bad. It's been some years ago, but there was a girl in our youth group that, for some reason, didn't like Doyla. Doyla had probably said something honest to her. Anyway, we were having brownies at youth group, and she said, these are great. Who made these? I said, Doyla made those. Oh, yuck. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's the way non-love is. Uh, love, love thinketh no evil. But when we don't love it, it just colors everything and makes it a problem. The, the term is actually an accountant's term. I, I was interested as I looked at that this week. It's the same word that's used in other places uh, with the word impute or reckon. Love thinketh no evil. Love doesn't keep an account of the wrongs that are, are done to us. Now, the importance of that, one of the main importance is that that's the way God treats us. He uses the word impute. It's the same word in the Greek in Romans 4, verse 8, when he says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You know, we're, we're so conscious of our sin, and we know God knows that we sin, but when you're forgiven, when you've trusted Christ as your Savior, when your sin is under the blood, God doesn't keep record of your sin anymore. It's gone. It's covered. Little kids' songs. Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Well, let me tell you something. It's true. <laughs> God does not impute our sins to us anymore. And that's the attitude God is talking about with us towards each other. We need to quit keeping track of how we've been wronged. And that's hard to do. <laughs> God can forget. I don't know if we can or not, but we can, we can, we can forgive. We can love. You know, when we're forgiven, stop and ask yourself, what does God keep track of? In Romans chapter 4 again, and uh, verse 3, he says, What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. 
God keeps track of righteousness. That's our record uh, before the Lord. Later on, uh, let's see, it's verse um, uh, 6. As David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You see, God justifies us. When God forgives us, he not only takes care of our sin, he gives us his righteousness. He puts it to our, our account because we don't have any of our own. Uh, God forgives our sins. He gives us his righteousness. In Philippians 3 and 9, he puts it this way, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Listen, that's religion. Religion says, you know, be good, maybe God will like you, and maybe you'll go to heaven. God says, we can be, we'll be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's Philippians 3.9. Jeremiah wrote, God, God says in Jeremiah, I should say, I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Aren't you glad? Uh, God doesn't think evil about us. He doesn't put it to our, our account when it's under the blood. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, he says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And what a blessing uh, that God, I mean, God knows we sin, but he knows they're under the blood. God uh, has this attitude towards us, and it should be our attitude as well. Love doesn't make memories out of evil. Now, some of you, God should be poking you right now because you have memories that you need to put aside. Every time they come up, you need to forgive. You need to love. Listen, no, no lesson like the one that you thought you already learned. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's things that are going to come up because the Holy Spirit's going to bring them up. And if he's bringing them up now, listen, make sure that you are, are following God's account of what love really is. Love thinketh no evil. It doesn't make memories out of evil. The next one there in, in 1 Corinthians 13, love rejoiceth not in iniquity. What verse are we in here? Uh, verse 6, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. We're not glad about sin. You know, sometimes we can look at other people's sins and, and it's almost a relief. We think, oh, uh, I'm not as bad as them. <laughs> uh, listen, we, we don't rejoice in iniquity. Some people rejoice in their own sin. Uh, you've probably met people like that. I hope you've not been a person like that where... Uh, I've heard this sometimes like in a public place. You'll hear people talking and they're bragging about their sin. Um, the Corinthians even boasted that they didn't so much boast about their sin, they just boasted about how good they were and ignored their sin. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a man named Ernest Hemingway. He, he was a well-known author. He was also a well-known uh, wicked man. Uh, he made this statement, you can sin and get away with it. Religious ideas about the consequences of sin are baloney. I'm living proof. Ten years later, almost to the day, he blew his brains out. Because sin does make a difference. Uh, love rejoiceth not in, in iniquity. A few years ago, I, I spent some time in the hospital. When I first arrived in my room, I was pretty much out of it. And uh, there was, I think, six men in, in the room. And uh, well, I was just laying there. They were talking. And some of them were swearing and telling stories. And ungodly talk. And as the day wore on, I began to feel a little bit better. And um, someone asked me, oh, and what do you do? And when I told him, the room got real quiet. <laughs> <laughs> now, we laugh about that, but they were rejoicing in iniquity. You know, they were bragging about their sins. Uh, they were you know, one-upmanship kind of a, of a thing. Uh, God says that that's not love. It doesn't rejoice in our own sin. It doesn't rejoice in the sins of others. You know, sometimes other people's sins make us look better or make our sins seem normal. 
One form of rejoicing in other people's sins is called gossip. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. Just because something is true doesn't mean it has to be said. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but someone wrote this. If you see a tall fellow ahead of the crowd, a leader of men marching fearless and proud, and, and you know of a tale whose mere telling aloud would cause this head in anguish be bowed, it's a pretty good plan to forget it. If you know of a spot in the life of a friend, we all have such spots concealed, world without end, whose touching his heartstrings would play on and rend till the shame of its showing no grieving could mend, it's a pretty good plan to forget it. Sometimes things just don't need to be said. Uh, there's a verse in, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and, and verse 8. I wanted to read the, the whole verse to you. But part of the message is, love covers a multitude of sins. Now, it's not saying as Christians we ignore sin and, and don't deal with it and so on. Uh, but the, the verse says this, Above all things have fervent charity. There's that word, love among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Listen, we all are damaged goods. We all have problems. But with the love of God, we can function together. We can focus on each other's weaknesses, we can focus on each other's faults, or we can love each other and try to help each other. Now, there's times when sin will affect us. And as a loving brother or sister, I'll go to my brother and sister and I'll speak to them privately about their sin because I care for them. Love covers a multitude of sins. I won't gossip about it. I won't bring it up as a prayer request so that others will know. I'll go to them in, in love. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity. Love doesn't even want to hear evil, let alone pass it on. Love doesn't want to parade others' faults and sins. You know, we can feel so good about ourselves by putting someone else down. That's not love. That's not right. We need to avoid self-righteousness. And we need to uh, honor others as the Lord does. He, he says in Galatians 6.1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Do you know what the law of Christ is? We've already said it. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. We need to look for opportunities to love. See, love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. What does love rejoice in? Love rejoices in the truth. We don't have to be afraid of the truth. Now, as Christians, we don't rejoice with false doctrine. You know, when somebody comes to us with another gospel, we don't say, oh, well, bless you, brother. You know, I know you're sincere. No, we share the, the scriptures with them. We speak the truth in love. Uh, love doesn't rejoice in open sin. You know, when, when someone says, oh, we're, we're going to have a homosexual marriage, we don't say, oh, great, let me, what can I get you for your, for your wedding? No, we, we, we share with them what God says about that kind of thing. And we do it in love. Uh, we don't, whip them down the street or take out some ad against them. Uh, we speak to them. Love rejoiceth in the truth. In uh, 2 John, it's one of those books that's only, only one chapter. Uh, he says in, in verse 5, I beseech thee, lady, he's writing to a lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Then he says, for many deceivers are entered into the world. And, and he talks about, if there come any unto you, in verse 10, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. Listen, the love of God is sometimes different than what you think. It isn't always patting somebody on the back and saying, oh, that's nice. <laughs> sometimes it's saying, listen, you're wrong. The love of God is, uh, loving God is obeying his commandments. Uh, love is no excuse for indiscriminate behavior. Well, we're in love, we'll just, no. Love loves the truth as well. A real love speaks the truth. 
We need to look for the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you find the truth, you'll, uh, you'll find things about the Lord Jesus. And he reveals truth, truth to us. But we need to be positive people. We don't want to just be negative people. Jesus was a positive person. Uh, his disciples were sinners. They, they weren't perfect. But boy, he worked with them. Uh, he, he did a, a wonderful job with them. And you know, in our families, it, it's, our family is going to reflect our attitudes toward truth, how we deal with truth, and how we deal with love. If I'm an angry person, or a negative person, or a proud person, that's going to come across in, in my family. I don't want to be tearing down my family, because they'll, they'll turn around and tear me down. I want to be building up my family, uh, so that they can help me as well. Uh, children learn what they live. Somebody wrote this, I don't remember who now. People need someone who appreciates the triumphs of ordinary people. People need someone who appreciates the triumphs of ordinary people. Yeah, most of us don't do anything great or special. But it's nice when somebody just appreciates who we are and what we're doing. Doyle and I, a while back, I can't remember, we were at one of our children's homes and we decided to go for a walk. And um, we came across a playground. Now, we didn't know any of those kids. None of those kids knew us. But you know what they called out to us? Several of them. Watch me. Watch me. Oh, watch me. <laughs> we look like grandparents, you know. We must look safe. I don't know. They just wanted somebody to appreciate them. You know, there's so much criticism and, and negativity in the world. Uh, we need to be careful that we're appreciating people and uh, being kind to them, appreciating each other, loving one another. See, the truth is we're all sinners. We're all sinners, and yet Jesus loves us. Aren't you glad? <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Uh, Jesus didn't rejoice in sin. Hebrews, it, it always startles me when I read Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Listen, Jesus doesn't rejoice in sin. He rejoices in the truth. And the truth is, we're all sinners, and God has a remedy for our sin. It's Jesus himself. He, when God saw our need, he didn't just condemn us. He made a way out. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is real easy to condemn others. God calls us to love. And sometimes to love people, we're going to have to contradict them. You know, we go out putting out pamphlets. We go to, I, I go door to door. Some of you do as well. Some of you go into town and you talk to people. Listen, to really love those people, sometimes you've got to contradict them. You've got to say, listen, you're wrong. If you continue this way, you'll end up in hell. Please, believe the gospel and be saved. And not everyone will believe. But I found this, when they do believe, they'll thank you. They'll be so glad that someone was willing to love them and tell them the, the truth. You know, love is the toughest thing you'll ever do. Some of the people you love the most will hurt you the most. That's the downside of being a pastor. You know, there's, there's people that are easy to love, and you know, they're faithful, and they say how nice you are as a pastor, and so on. You, you don't see a lot of my ministry. And I deal with, with people. My heart goes out, out to them. I'll use the term, and I don't mean it in a bad way, but I deal with a lot of vile people. Just vile people. I mean, they know I'm a pastor, and they use just foul, awful language, just in normal conversation with a man that they, they know will offend. Because that's their habit. That's just the way they are. And you try to share the love of God with them. And sometimes you spend hours with them. And nothing. You multiply that by everyone in the world, and that's what God experiences. God loves us. God loves those wicked people. 
God loves us wicked people without Christ. You know, without the Lord, we're, we're as wicked as anybody else. Uh, the love of God, it, it'll take great commitment for you to love. You'll be tempted probably every day not to love, not to forgive, not to say the kind thing. To do all the opposites of what we're reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It takes great strength and discipline and commitment to, to the Lord. But it starts by responding to God's love. It starts by trusting Christ as your Savior. God says here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, the covering for our sins. I don't know, I guess the, the picture that comes to my mind is a tarp. <laughs> Yeah, just a, a blanket. God became the blanket to cover our sins. Just gave himself for us. Are you saved? Are you born again? Have you understood how much God loves you and responded to him? That, uh, that passage that I mentioned is from 1 John 4.11. Uh, the next verse says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And it's true. Love will cover a multitude of sins. With God's love, we can get along. We can work together. We can be a blessing to each other. Uh, let me ask you this morning. Number one, are you right with God? Are you saved? Are you faithful? But as well, are you right with others? Are there folks that come to mind that you resent? The folks that have, have wronged you or that you've wronged them? And you've never, never made it right. Um, love is kind. Uh, all of these different things that we've looked at, but today especially, love doesn't rejoice in sin, and it does rejoice in the truth. The truth is, we need the love of God, and we need to show it to others. Now, let's go to the Lord in, in prayer this morning. Their heads bowed in, in, in an attitude of prayer. Maybe the Lord has brought a situation or a person to your mind that, that you need to deal with. And you need to do it today. Maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart and you realize that you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. If you died, you're not sure you'd go to heaven. Whatever your need, God can meet your need this morning. Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for your love and sending your Son. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us and dying for our sins, taking our sins, becoming sin for us. Lord, I pray that we would understand this message this morning. Help us to apply it in our homes. Help us to apply it at work. Help us to live it in our daily lives. Father, help us to love you first of all and then to love others. Thank you that you love us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing uh, page 163. as a song only.